I just started living that Hollywood lifestyle. I was out almost every night with my roommates, partying, getting drunk. I flew across the world <laughs> a few weeks later to Rome. It was there that I saw the beauty of our faith. Started hanging out with all these Catholics in Hollywood. I didn't even know they existed. As an actress, my roommates and I just hung out by the pool all day long. So my daily uniform, it was a bikini. I started to learn about modesty and I'm like, you know what, I have my business degree and it seems like people want this and it doesn't exist. So let me just make my own business. <laughs> Jessica Ray, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's so nice to see you again. I know. It's been many, many years. I think, it was it a decade that we figured out? Probably more. <laughs> in, in Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, yeah. Through some mutual friends. That's right. <laughs> All right. So some people already know about your work and who you are, but some people are going to discover you're lovely inside and out. You've founded a modest swimsuit brand, and you have an amazing, I think, testimony personally and a lot of insight on what beauty and modesty even mean. So we haven't really talked about modesty on the podcast. Uh -oh. So you are breaking the ice for us. Thank you for being here to do dun, it. Dun, dun. Um, okay, so where, where should we start? Let's start with who is Jessica Ray? Who is she? Um, well, I am a wife and mother. I have three beautiful babies, even if doctors told me I would never, ever conceive or get pregnant or have any children at all. Um, there's a miracle story behind that if you want to hear it later. Um, and I'm a business person and a follower of Christ. And what's your business? I um, started a company called Ray Swimwear. Now it's just called Jessica Ray because we've sort of branched out into other types of clothing. Uh, so it's more than swimwear. But I uh, have been doing that for maybe 16, 17 years now. And so you said you, doctor said you couldn't have three kids, but you have three. Congratulations. Yes. Thank you. Did you always want to be a mom? I've always just wanted to be a mom my whole life. Um, I got married and I discovered that I have endometriosis really bad. So went to a Catholic doctor and had a procedure to remove the polyps, thinking that that would work. And they were like, oh, it just created more scar tissue. Mm -hmm. So then I, we decided to do another procedure with another Catholic doctor and after that surgery, she said that I would never get pregnant. It was it was so, she didn't even say like, unless there's a miracle, I'm thinking, you're a Catholic doctor. Like, why aren't you at least giving me some sort of hope? But she showed me when she did the surgery, she did a video like of the insides. And she's like, do you see all of this scar tissue? There is literally nothing that can be done. And if you have another procedure, it's just going to create more scar tissue. So... I'm not a person who typically gets like so sad or depressed or anything like that, but it was, it was a very dark time for a couple of weeks, but we had a, a trip planned down to Mexico city with one of our priest friends and five of my girlfriends and my husband. And I had never been down to Mexico city. We had a little pilgrimage and we prayed in front of the image of our lady of Guadalupe and I just remember sitting there staring at her because, you know, she's pregnant in that image and staring at her womb and being so, like, mad. Like, I did everything, God. I did everything the doctors told me to do. We did the injections and the, you know, the two surgeries to remove the polyps and the endometriosis. And I ate all the organic things and I didn't eat the sugar and I didn't eat the desserts. And, and now I'm never going to be pregnant. And I was just so mad. And I said, I give up. I give up. I will not do any of this anymore. And I sobbed. Mm -hmm. And then I went home and I realized that I should have gotten my cycle when we were in Mexico. And so I took a pregnancy test thinking, I'm going to start my cycle on this test. I just know it because that's exactly what would happen every time. But it was positive. And I called my sister because our mom had passed away already by that time. She was a labor and delivery nurse. So, um, I would have called my mom. I called my sister who had already had two babies. And I said, I'm pregnant. And she said, what's your due date? And I said, I don't even know how to figure that out. And she said, what was the first day of, of your last cycle? And so I told her and she said, okay, your due date is December 12th. Wow. And I, I dropped the phone. I was like, and she didn't understand because she's, uh, she's not a practicing Catholic, but I was like, that, uh, like, that's the feast day of Our Lady of Guadalupe. 
Um, and so it was a total, I called the doctor who told me I would never get pregnant. And she, it was so weird. She was just like, oh, okay well, you should probably start some progesterone so you don't have a miscarriage. And I'm like, are you not going to say <laughs> Thank you, Mary, to me <laughs> wow. like, about how you threw me into this spiral of darkness for two weeks and told me I would never get pregnant. But um, we had an ultrasound and I was so afraid that I would have a miscarriage. Um, but I had a trip planned a couple weeks later to, we had a private audience with Pope Benedict mm -hmm. And we met with him on his birthday, which was in April. And we sang happy birthday, and I gave him some chocolate. And then it was my turn to talk to him. And I said, I am pregnant, and it's a miracle of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And I quickly told him the story, will you bless my baby and my womb? And he was like, see, see. So he gave me a blessing. We went home, had my son in December, thought it would be our only child. Six months later, I was pregnant again, and my daughter's due date was Pope Benedict's birthday. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. And then we have my son, and he has no specific miracle attached to him, but he's the cutest. <laughs> he's the cutest. He's just adorable. <laughs> yeah. That is amazing. Yeah. So that was, um, it's it's a story that I tell to people who aren't even Catholic, and the hairs on their arms will stand up. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. You just, you, and it, God is just... I think maybe he knows I'm the type of person that he kind of has to like smack in the head to be like, that was me <laughs> so that I don't try to claim it for myself. But amazing. Really, truly. He's so good. And, um, and I'm just so blessed. We did an episode with Father Spitzer on Our Lady okay. of Guadalupe and the science behind the image. And it's unbelievably it is incre I've incredible. I've heard his talk and but miracles are still happening. I know. Like yours. I know. We eventually want to go down and hold my son up, who's now 13. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Sing the Lion King <laughs> song. <laughs> but yeah, it's he's, you know, every child is a gift and a miracle. But when multiple doctors tell you that you will never, ever get pregnant, um, and then you do, it's it's really, really, truly, you know, just... A miracle. It's amazing. And tell me about your work before starting your swimwear company. So before I started the swimwear company, um, I actually grew up in Orange County nice. and I majored in accounting. And then I graduated and discovered that I did not want to be an accountant. So I thought, well, what can I do? Let me just go to grad school and spend more money <laughs> trying to figure out what I want to do. So I ended up moving up to LA um, to get my MBA and started working at a TV film production company as an accountant. And the in-house manager, talent manager, kept telling me that I should act. And I was like, ah, leave me alone. I'm very happy with my calculator and my spreadsheets. And she would not leave me alone. Please just go on an audition, go on an audition. And so I finally agreed to go on one audition if she would just leave me alone after that thinking nothing of it. And I went and I booked it and it was a national network commercial for Kellogg's Raisin Bran Crunch. Um, Delicious. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which I do not allow my children to eat. <laughs> not good. And uh, Is that because of the, the non-organic oats or oh, what is just it? All of all it. Of it. Yeah. Okay. Um, but we, um, this was back a long time ago when national network commercials paid great residuals before all of the newbie, new media internet stuff. And it pretty much paid for my graduate degree at uh, Loyola Marymount University. And so I was like, wow, this is great. I mean, it's easy work. I'm just going to keep doing it. So the manager there got me a commercial agent and I did commercials for a year. Uh, right before I graduated, I decided, let me try to get a TV film agent. And I sent my headshot out and only one person would take me because I hadn't really done any acting before. And my very first audition was for the Power Rangers and I booked it. Wow. So I had to choose between finishing my graduate degree. I had two classes left and becoming a series regular on this very popular children's TV show as a Power Ranger. Um, and of course I chose the TV show. I did go back and, and finish my degree, which made my parents very happy. Um, but then I just started living that Hollywood lifestyle. I was out almost every night with my roommates, partying, 
getting drunk, dancing like a lunatic till the wee hours of the morning. And then one day, this guy in my acting class was like, what are you doing? What are you doing tomorrow? I'm like, why? Where's the party? I'll bring my roommates. And he's like, oh, I'm going to this thing called prayer and pasta. And I'm like, ooh, <laughs> what is that? He's like, oh, first we pray the rosary and then we, we eat pasta. And I'm like, oh, I grew up praying the rosary. I, I grew up Catholic, but was never really very well formed. And I like pasta and I didn't have anything going on. So I decided, you know, I'll, I'll go. I'll try it out. I'll meet you there. I went early because I didn't want to go in without him. And I waited in the parking lot at this place called Family Theater in Hollywood. And I did not see him go in. And I kept looking at my time. I'm like, now I'm going to be late and I'm going to interrupt the rosary. <laughs> and I didn't want to draw attention to myself. So I went in and I prayed the rosary with complete strangers, which was very uncomfortable for me. I had only ever prayed it with my grandparents and my family. And then when it was time for pasta, I decided to try to sneak out because this guy, his name was Jose. He never showed up and I never saw him ever again. Wow. So this other Is guy. Is he real? Do you think he, Jose I don't was know. real? I mean, I have no idea. I don't even remember his last name to be able to look him up and Jose. Were you texting with him about where to go? I, I, this or, was like before people were texting all so the time. So he just told you this is the location. That it was starts it. at this time. And you're like, okay, I'm going to just be open. Sh check it out. Right, right. Wow. And I was so out of my comfort zone praying with strangers. And so I just really wanted to leave. And on my way out, I heard another guy talking about how he was in seminary in Rome. And he had to be emergency flown into Los Angeles for back surgery. And I had just met with a surgeon at Cedar sinai because I have scoliosis. I have a really bad back and I was on the fence. Do I do it? Do I not? So I gave him my card. I'm like, I'm not trying to hit on you. I just overheard your story about your back surgery. I'd love to know who your surgeon was and if you would recommend him or her. So I ended up meeting with this guy for coffee to talk about his surgery a week later. And he's like, oh, I have to go to Rome. I have to clean up my seminary room. I can't travel alone. I have back problems. And being as crazy as I was, I was like, oh, I'll go with you. So I flew across the world <laughs> a few weeks later to Rome and stayed in a convent, which was, you know, I had never, we hung out with priests and seminarians, which I had never done before in my life. I'm like, oh, these are normal people. <laughs> like, and I met a bunch of, of nuns and um, staying in a convent. And I just, it was there that I saw the beauty of our faith, of our Catholic faith, and hanging out with all of these seminarians and going to these events and going to the Vatican and seeing the art and all the things, I just fell in love. And I'm like, I want, I want to know more. I want to learn more. And this is my faith and I know nothing about it. A big thank you to our partner, Hallow. Hallow is the number one prayer app on the globe. This app has thousands of prayers, guided meditations, scripture readings, and more for you to deepen your faith life. If you download Hallow today using the link in the description, you will get three months free. Their content doesn't just include prayers and scripture readings, but it also includes sleep stories to help you fall asleep and kids content so that you can listen to it with your kids in the car on the way to school or when you're running errands or whatever you're doing and they can grow in their faith too. The reason that Hallow is the number one prayer app because it's excellent content that is deeply rooted in your faith. Everything about Hallow is designed to create a deeper prayer experience for you in the busyness of your daily life. So go to the link in the description to download Hallow for free for three months to deepen your prayer life. And I'm like, I want, I want to know more. I want to learn more, and this is my faith, and I know nothing about it. So I um, flew home and uh, started hanging out with all these Catholics in Hollywood. I didn't even know they existed, and started doing ministry at the parish um, that was closest to my house. And one day I was uh, going out with this seminarian guy and a bunch of other people, and I opened the door, and he's like, what are you wearing? He's like, you can't wear that. And I'm like, what do you mean? And it was a really short skirt. And he's like, you can't wear a skirt that's as small as a belt. And I was like, ew, ew, you're not my dad. Don't talk to me like that. But I went in and I changed. And his comment just stuck in the back of my head. And I couldn't, I was so mad. And I guess because I had such emotional feelings about it, it made me want 
to know why would he, what, why does he think he has the right to say such a thing to me? And that was my deep dive into modesty. So I started learning more about it. And uh, as an actress in Hollywood, my roommates and I just hung out by the pool all day long waiting for auditions. So my daily uniform was, it was a bikini. And I had drawers full of bikinis. And I started to learn about modesty. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to make a modest swimsuit because they just don't exist right now. The only one-piece swimsuits were for grandmas or for toddlers or babies at the time. And this was like 18 years ago. And I have no background in fashion design. I cannot draw still to this day, and I can't sew. I just have a really great team of people that I verbalize my designs to, and they make it become reality. Um, and so that's where the first design that I did was really just for myself to wear at the pool. And then all these people at my apartment building started asking, where did you get that? I love that. And I thought, you know what? I have my business degree and it seems like people want this and it doesn't exist. So let me just make my own business. And that was 18 years ago. That was about 18 years ago. How many swimsuits have you sold? Oh my gosh. I don't even know. It was, so I gave a talk on YouTube called the evolution of the swimsuit um, years later. And it went viral because people basically wanted to kill me after hearing it. It was a eight or nine minute talk and they called me all sorts of horrific names and words and said I was a rape advocate and all these terrible things. So, you know, that's why things go viral. People love it and people hate it. And after it went viral, the next day, everything on my website sold out. And wow. I had to start taking pre-orders and find a bigger factory. And um, then I think for five or six years, the talk just kept circulating. Every spring, as soon as it would get hot outside, people would start sharing it. I think it's because no one wants to talk about modesty, right? They don't want to talk about it with their kids or with their friends or their spouse even sometimes. So they'd rather just repost <laughs> this video to their Facebook feed or their Instagram stories. Um, and so that was my marketing. I didn't spend a dime on any other kind of marketing. It was just that one video that kept selling out our swimsuits year after year after year. All right. I've got a lot of questions okay. because I want to, I want to <laughs> hear about what you said in that video Okay, because it's fascinating. Before that, though, you were talking about getting on this plane randomly with a seminarian that you I met know. about back surgery. And I, I just, I, when you shared that, I just had to pause for a minute because I, I love Los Angeles. I went to school there. You know, you and I are, you know, in Southern California right now. We love this area. I know you're not here anymore, but you, this is like a home for you as well. And I think there's something about even LA particularly, but the, the industry, entertainment industry, this like radical openness that a lot mm -hmm. of people have to opportunity where they're just going to say, walk through whatever door seems to open and just see what happens. That's this, right. This love of adventure. Do you think that was, were, was that driving you or what, what do you make of that? I, I don't know. I mean, I think about it now and I'm like, dude, he could have kidnapped me and <laughs> killed me in Europe or something, you know, but my, my friends, you know, after sitting down with him for coffee, talking about his back surgery, and he was a seminarian, his bishop had sent him to Rome from Detroit. Um, and I was like, this guy is totally harmless, but my si my now sister-in-law- And he has a broken back, so how bad back. can it be? Come on. But I- And you're a power ranger at this exactly, point too. Exactly, so You're going to totally take care of yourself. My sister-in-law and then a, a group of my girlfriends, when I told them, oh, I'm going to go to Rome in a few weeks with this this guy, and they were like, and it wasn't, we weren't romantically interested in each other at all. And they were like, you're crazy. He, he's going to like be an ax murderer or something. And- they said, we have to meet him first. So um, they met him. We had an invitation to an NBA all-star party. <laughs> this was the life that we were living. And so I told him, hey, I'll get you on the list. Just come to this party. And it was all NBA all-star players and then a bunch of beautiful girls and my and a seminarian. former seminarian friend. <laughs> And we get there. And He's like I, eating pizza. Like, no, oh, I know. Oh, where am I right now? <laughs> the girl with the back surgery is taking me to unload my dorm in Rome. Exactly. So I'm going. <laughs> so I go to the bathroom and I come back and my friends were like, oh, he's fine. 
you can go to Rome with him. He's fine. And I said, You're why? They're like, he didn't even drink. He just ate pizza. No, it was, I mean, it was really like that. We had just yeah. all arrived. And I said, what happened? You guys were so worried. And they said, when you were in the bathroom, he told us that he's a virgin. <laughs> and I was like, first of all, why would he tell you that? That's so weird. But a virgin can still be an ax murderer. <laughs> so, but this, you know, this is, it, it's like my roommates had never heard of such a thing that there could be a virgin walking around Los Angeles at the age of 24 or however old he was. And for some reason that made them think, oh, he's harmless. You could totally beat him up if you needed to. Yeah. It was bizarre. It was a weird time. So, and, and during this time you were doing the Power Ranger thing. It was, this was after the Power Rangers. Okay. Um, I was still acting though. So I was still guest starring and doing recurring roles on various various shows and it became more and more difficult for me because as an actress, um, you know, you can't ever say no. If you say no, then your agent or manager will drop you and they'll just get the next person. Um, and it really is, it's an industry where you truly feel objectified. Um, you, you know, you go there thinking, oh, I'm unique. I am beautiful. A lot of people are the, you know, the prom queen and all these things, they come from these small towns and they get to Hollywood because people told them, you're going to make it. You're the most beautiful. You're the most talented. And then they get there and they realize, oh my goodness, so is everybody else. And when you go to an audition, especially me back, back then, um, I would go to these specific ethnic auditions where they wanted Asian or they wanted Mexican or they wanted Indian. And my agent never knew really where to place me. But you walk into a room where everybody else looks exactly like you and they're probably prettier or they have better hair or they're curvier or taller or whatever else the casting is looking for. And you start to feel, um, you know, God made us all unique and beautiful and you don't feel that way at all. You just feel like an object that your agent is thrown out there for these roles. So finally, when you do book one thing, or you do get an audition and you're like, oh, I can't do that. Like, I, I That's just, an example of something that you so, dealt with. Well, here's an example. So I, I booked a show that I didn't even audition for. My manager called me and said, they're going to um, have a courier come and bring you the script. And it was a recurring role on a TV show. And I was like, well, that's weird. Like, I don't even read for this. So I get the script. And the first page, it takes place in Cancun. And I'm like, so the first thing that went through my mind was, oh, no, they're going to want me to wear a bikini <laughs> because it's a beach thing, obviously. And I was like, oh, no, I, I can't wear a bikini. I, I, I make modest swimsuits and I don't wear bikinis anymore. So I told my agent and he's like, well, you go, just go and talk to them about it, but you might have to wear it. And, I, and I, I told him, I'm not going to do the role if I have to wear it. So I got there for the wardrobe fitting and I brought every single swimsuit that I had of mine um, that was a, like a two, tankini, two-piece thing or whatever, one piece. I brought it in and they were like, okay, go into the dressing room and that we have a bunch of bikinis in there. And I looked at the wardrobe stylist and said, um, I can't wear a bikini. <laughs> She's like, what do you mean you can't wear a bikini? I said, I just don't wear them. I said, I don't feel comfortable in a bikini and I don't want to be in a bikini on television. And she said, well, what are you going to wear then? And I said, I brought like a luggage full of suit, swimsuits. And she said, well, put it on, but it's up to the director. It's not up to me. So I tried on maybe five or six of my one piece swimsuits and they were like, okay, that's fine. You can, you can wear that. And I was so, I was so relieved um, that they said yes, but there, you know, there's the fear that you say no. And now I no longer have this fear. I am still acting, um, doing little things, commercial things here and there. My kids also do ads with us. Um, and I have no fear anymore of just saying nope. And if you don't want to represent us anymore, then, then you don't, but I'm not going to be a slave to this industry anymore, whereas I feel scared, you know, that I'm going to get rejected and, and turned away. Um, 
Yeah. The very best way to start your day is with a steaming cup of coffee, but not just any coffee. You're going to want to drink seven weeks coffee because it is the most delicious coffee that you will ever taste. If you go to sevenweekscoffee.com today, you'll see all the different blends and roasts that they have, but this is low acid, gourmet, ethically sourced, small batch roasted, delicious coffee. It's what I love to drink in the morning and you're going to love it too. What I love about sevenweekscoffee.com is not only is it ethically sourced and the best beans, they use the top one to 2% of all beans in the world to make their coffee, but seven weeks coffee also gives a full 10% of all their revenue directly back to the pro-life movement, to pregnancy resource centers. In fact, they are almost hitting the milestone with your help of a half a million dollars, $500,000 donated directly to help moms and babies in need. You can be a part of this by going to sevenweekscoffee.com today. You can pick your favorite subscription of your favorite blend of coffee. My favorite is the medium Ethiopian roast. And if you become a member of the Heartbeat Club, meaning you're going to get coffee delivered to your door every single month, you'll get a full 15% off your order. And if you use the code Lila at checkout, you'll get another 10% off your order for a full 25% off your first order of seven weeks coffee. So go right now to sevenweekscoffee.com, pick your favorite coffee blend, put in your order, use the code Lila at checkout for up to 25% off your first order. Know that you're not only drinking a delicious cup of steaming hot coffee in the morning, but you are supporting the pro-life movement, giving back 10% of everything that you order to help moms and babies in need. Go check them out today. That's sevenweekscoffee.com. You are going to love this coffee and you're going to love this mission just as much. That's awesome. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, I I think it's an example to people listening because I think there's so much fear and not just in like entertainment world, but in any world of standing for your beliefs and standing up for truth or what's right. And people either just are quiet or they compromise or they just kind of delete themselves from the opportunity. They don't even try. Right. But the fact that you showed up. Yeah. You had a solution. Yeah. You were polite about it. Yeah. And they ended up going with your solution. Right. And if they didn't, then I knew I had already made the decision beforehand. Mm-hmm. I'm just not. I'm going to walk away. I'm going to walk away and just say no um, and really hold myself to that. So did you when you shared that story with like your roommates or other friends, did you feel that people were were people surprised? Like, how could you have even brought your own swimsuits or what was kind of the reaction you got from friends at around that you time, at the time? I was already um, just hanging out with all people of the same mindset. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, maybe there were a few people that didn't understand, but, um, you know, for the most part, everyone was super on board and cheering me on. And I do think it's, that's why it's important to surround yourself with people who will support you and encourage you in your beliefs and your convictions when it comes to that kind of stuff. Because if I did get rejected, then of course there would be a a feeling of sadness maybe, or, you know, who knows what, but then I have my friend, my friends there in my community saying, you know, don't worry about it and supporting me in that decision. What was your bikini talk about? (laughs) So the viral bikini video. So it was called The Evolution of the Swimsuit. And I basically talked about the um, origin of the bikini. And it was um, designed by a man named Louis Rayard, French man. And it was so explosive because no one had ever worn something like that before that he named it after an atomic bomb site, Bikini Atoll. I don't know if I'm saying that correct. Um, but he couldn't find any models who would wear it. So he had to hire a stripper um, or an exotic dancer maybe to to model it. What year was for this? him? It was, I want to say it was in the 50s. Uh, it's been a while since I gave the talk. But, uh, and then there was the sex, sexual revolution and the bikini became more widely accepted. But the t- in the talk, I showed pictures of you know, before that women wore one piece swimsuits. And even before that women wore these crazy voluminous dresses that you would basically drown in. (laughs) You tried to swim in it, but they used bathhouses. It was a six by six by six sort of like hut on wheels and horses, or people would bring them down to the water so that women could get out in their bathing costumes and get directly into the water. So no one would see them. Um, 
so I so I said in the talk that you know I'm not sure how we got from wearing a 36 square foot house to wearing barely 36 inches of fabric at the beach um, if even that some days so, or these days I just came from Europe so <laughs> um so people people got really mad um you know in the talk I I discussed how I believe we're made in the image and likeness of God and we're all made beautiful and at the end, I just asked, you know, how will you use your beauty, your God-given beauty? And it made people mad. It made people say that I, um, yeah, that I'm a rape advocate, that basically if they're wearing a bikini and they get raped, then I'm saying that they were asking for it and they deserved it and absolutely was not saying that at all, um, you know. So that's where the, the controversy came from. This idea of how will you use your beauty? I love that question. It's such a powerful one. What is it? What does your what's your take on the standards of modesty? Because I'm sure people right now are listening and they maybe some of them are like, hey, bikinis are not a big deal. It just has to be a more modest bikini. Right. And then maybe other people are saying, listen, it's not about any particular clothing guideline because cultures are all different. It's really about just your heart. God only sees the heart. Wow. So I, I'm just representing, you know, some of the views that I hear often, even right. from, you know, Christians or conservatives oh, or yeah. whatever it may be. It's such an explosive topic. And I've given like two day conferences <laughs> on this because I don't We've got time, Jessica. <laughs> yeah. I don't think you can really talk about it in an, you know, an hour allotted by whatever conference I go to speak about modesty. I, I wrote a book, it's like a coffee table style book that sold out and I, I didn't reprint it. I'm working on updating it, but I co-wrote it with Leah Darrow, um, who I think, you know, and the first chapter is, it just talks about our inherent dignity, because I really think that the conversation has to start there. Um, and a lot of people think about modesty and they think um, that it's about these rules, like two fingers below the collarbone. You can't show your elbows. You can't show your knees. You can't wear pants ever. Um, and I've had people tell me there's no way that you can design and create a modest swimsuit because the swimsuit can never ever be modest and women just shouldn't be wearing them. So are those people recommending that pe women don't swim? I'm not, I'm not sure if they recommend, I've heard some people say you should only swim in your own backyard pool wow. where there's no one else around. And this is another reason that the talk went viral because it was very interesting to see, I had to stop reading the comments because it drove me crazy, but some people were saying, oh, you're advocating for rape. And other people were saying, um, those aren't modest. Her swimsuits aren't modest at all. So it's like it's too modest or not modest enough. And people get into these arguments even on our Facebook page or our Instagram page. Um, Harris, can you pull up a clip from the YouTube? Yeah. It's the history of the bikini. The, right? evolution, the of evolution of the, the bikini. Swimsuit. Yeah. But I, I didn't even know they were recording. I didn't know they were recording it. I didn't know that it was out there. It was one of my friends who said, did you know? Your talk is on This is YouTube? the Q conference that you spoke at? Yes. It's not called Think, right? They rebranded? They they rebranded yeah. to Think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've actually never watched it myself. Oh, really? Oh, wow. <laughs> this is fun. Okay. I can't stand to listen to myself. <laughs> you sound great, okay? <laughs> Everylife.com is America's fastest growing baby diaper company. I love everylife.com because they not only make amazing products, these diapers are leak proof with great quality materials, but this is also a diaper that is made with love by a pro-life company that is giving back to the pro-life movement. So when you go to everylife.com, you set up your diaper subscription for that little one in your life that you love. You're not only getting an amazing product for your little one, but you're also supporting the pro-life movement. Did you know that companies, unfortunately like Pampers and Huggies, are owned by conglomerates that actually are pro-abortion that donate money to groups like Planned Parenthood? Not so with everylife. Everylife.com is not only a best-in-class product for babies, but it also loves babies and supports babies by supporting the pro-life movement. So go to everylife.com today, order your diapers and wipes subscription or gift a friend who might need diapers and wipes for their little one and use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. That's everylife.com and use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. A few years ago, 
male college students at Princeton Univer University participated in studies of how the male brain reacts to seeing people in different amounts of clothing. Brain scans revealed that when men are shown pictures of scantily clad women, the region of the brain associated with tools such as screwdrivers and hammers lit up. Some men showed zero laughing. brain it's activity in the medial prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain that lights up when one ponders another person's thoughts, feelings, and intentions. Researchers found this shocking because they almost never see this part of the brain shut down in this way. And a Princeton professor said, it's as if they're reacting to these women as if they are not fully human. It's consistent with the idea that they are responding to these photographs as if they were responding to objects, not people. In a separate Princeton study, when men viewed images of women in bikinis, they often associated with first person action verbs, such as I push, I grab, I handle. But when they saw images of women dressed modestly, they associated them with third person action verbs, such as she pushes, she grabs. Analysts at the National Geographic concluded that bikinis really do inspire men to see women as objects, as something to be used rather than someone to connect with. So it seems that wearing a bikini does give a woman power, the power to shut down a man's ability to see her as a person, but rather as an object. Okay, that was very powerful. You have the data that you're sharing. Did anybody that was upset with you after this video respond to that particular point you were making about what the studies show? A lot of them said that, oh, in the studies, it was a bunch of rapists or pedophiles or, you know, and I, I was like, I, Meaning I just, they somehow only surveyed rapists exclusively, yeah, not just they, men at they large. They were already ag sexually aggressive men is what they had told me. Um, but I'm, and I'm telling you, I've never listened to this before. I'm like sweating over here <laughs> watching myself because I hate listening oh. to myself talk. But um, I didn't know that you could hear the men in the audience laughing. I just realized that as we're watching it. And this was a Christian conference, mm -hmm. and most of the people, I would say 90% men who were um, entrepreneurs and or pastors or Christian speakers, and they laughed when I said the research because, and I had some people tell me afterwards, you didn't need to cite research for that. Like, mm. you know, they laughed because it was like a guilty laugh. Mm. Like, they know that that's the way that, you know, they're not rapists or sexually aggressive, you know, they're just saying, yeah, you know, that's kind of what comes across our mind when, when we see that. So anyway, I think that's really interesting. And I'd rather listen to them laughing than myself. No, speaking, no. So. You, you're doing that's great. Not <laughs> I think, um, I think that there's a lot of shame around this topic and people get very quickly defensive and sometimes understandably so, mm. because I do think there's a lot of extremes in our culture today, but I think the ground of st the stake the ground that you're staking, which is that the bikini was extreme 50, right. 60, 70 years ago. Yeah. Now it's so ubiquitous, so we think it's totally normal. But according to this data that you're sharing, it it does draw attention to particular parts of the bodies that that are used for sex. Typically, mm -hmm. I mean, again, obviously breasts are also used for breastfeeding and everything right. else. You don't have to sexualize breasts always, but those are what are coined the private parts for a reason. Right. So I think that, uh, you know, again, we haven't talked about this yet on, on the show here, but growing up, the bikini was always something when I was a kid, I would talk about with my mom. My mom was not like a super, you have to wear only skirts and long sleeve shirts, but there was this kind of common discussion we would have this knowledge and in, in even friends, conversations with friends that the bikini was like pushing it. Mm. If you're a teenage girl wearing a bikini, that's kind of pushing it on the modest standard. But I think today, a lot of people just think, oh, if you're against a bikini, you are crazy. Oh, yeah. It's just a normal, it's just a normal thing now, now to wear. Um, and even, you know, the one piece swimsuits that exist are like with all the cutouts and they're super low cut or very high cut. I don't know. I don't understand some of them. I'm like, why is it smaller in the front. <laughs> One just, strip, tiny strip. Yeah, I don't get it. <laughs> and and I think it's important is this is not to shame anyone who has worn or no. does wear bikinis. 
And I don't think your posture was a shaming one. You're sharing research, you're sharing the history, and that enough got people, some people to be upset because I think we would prefer that we lived in a world where you can do whatever you want and there's never any, any exactly. negative consequences. Exactly. And I, I can understand why people want to live in that world because it eliminates sort of us having to deal with these thornier questions or these gray right. areas that may require us to even make compromises that we otherwise would not want to make, such as, okay, I'm not going to wear a bikini, right. even though I prefer it. Right. And I mean, modesty isn't just about, you know, not wearing a bikini or like I said, the inches and all these things, but it's a, it's an interior disposition and it is externally shown in the way you dress, but also the way you speak and the way you carry yourself, the way you treat other people. So I think when people get so oh, like defensive about that word modesty, they're immediately thinking, oh, she's telling me I can't wear pants or I can't do this or I can't do that. And instead of thinking like, what can I not do? I think people really need to think about, you know, I am a temple of the Holy Spirit. I was made in the image and likeness of God. Does, do these words honor God? Do, does this dress, this swimsuit, does it, does it honor God? What I'm wearing, what I'm saying, how I'm acting. Um, and I think that's, that should be the way people think about modesty instead of the negative, like you can't do this, you can't wear this, you can't say that. But really, before you speak, like, okay, should the, gossip, for example, like, should I, should I be saying this? Does, is, are these words honoring God? Oh, probably not. I'll just keep it to myself. What do you think are some standards for modesty separate from swimsuits? So it sounds like you're like, yeah, bikinis don't do it. Yeah. But what about other forms of clothing? Um, I, I do think it's- And can you do a modest bikini? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know about a modest bikini, um, but, and I, I do think it's situational. Uh, for example, if you're going to go to, to church or any sacred space in Italy, you they have these signs outside of the door that are the guidelines the of dress, their dress code. So I just got back from Italy and, you know, it's basically you don't show your shoulders. I think like men can't wear shorts if I, I saw that correctly or, you know, you have nothing to Nothing above the knee. Nothing above the for knee. For men, I think maybe for men and women. Right. Right. Which for men now, a lot of men are wearing these super short shorts. That I'm <laughs> I generally, for myself, I think it also depends on your body type. And I'm, I'm pretty slim. I always have been. It's just how I was made. And so I don't have a lot of curves. Um, maybe if someone was a little curvy than I am, or if I was nursing a baby, I would have a little bit of a higher neckline. And, um, but I don't, I, I, I don't think one rule, blanket rule, applies to every person or situation. And that's why it is very difficult to, to talk about. So what would you recommend for people listening? They're like, okay, I would like to be modest, but not in the way that it's like extreme and frumpy and like the obviously modest person who's always buttoned up, you know, but I want to be beautiful and fashionable. What would you recommend? I think in the book that I wrote, um, we talked about tightness of clothing, not just when it comes to modesty, but um, you know, when people are wearing things that are too tight and you can basically see the outline of their undergarments. Um, I think that we shouldn't be able to see your undergarments on the outside <laughs> of your clothing. So it shouldn't be too tight, not too low cut, maybe not too short. Like if you need to constantly adjust your clothing. So my husband is a, is a high school teacher and we chaperone a dance every year. And every year I feel like the girls' dresses were getting shorter and shorter and tighter and tighter. And, you know, there'll be stairs at the venue and I'm going upstairs and, you know, I can see your underwear and your, the girls don't even look comfortable. They're like constantly tugging down on their dress or their skirt and constantly pulling things up. And so when you get dressed, you should look in the mirror and make sure that your outfit isn't see-through. Um, you know, stand in front of the window or something because I one time was at an event and this girl walked through and her dress, it was maybe this kind of color, but it was sheer and you could see her undergarments and she didn't realize it. But as she walked through, I think she saw the look on people's faces like, oh no, like they were just like a little bit embarrassed for her. And um, she went and told a friend of mine like, 
oh my gosh, why didn't anyone tell me that, that my dress is see-through? And she, she ended up leaving. Um, but things like that, you know, look in the mirror and move in your clothing. Is this going to move when I have to raise my arms or bend over to pick something up? I mean, I think it's good. I remember my dad telling me as a girl, and he was always pretty gentle about clothing stuff, and my mom was pretty gentle, so I think they were pretty balanced. But my dad would say modesty is contextual a lot of the time, like Mm -hmm. you just said, whether you're at church or you're at the pool, you're going to be wearing different clothing. Right. So part of it is that. Part of it is the disposition of your heart and how you behave with other people, not wanting people to just like look at you and, you know, right. like gawk at you, but you want to engage people and get to know them for yes. who they are and you want them to know who you for who you are. Uh, but then also that there are extremes on both sides. Like you can go the extreme of the super skimpy bikini and wearing the see-through dress or no dress at all. I mean, Kanye West is parading around his new, I guess, wife, mm-hmm. naked, literally yeah. naked. Yeah. And I think it's so disrespectful. Uh, she's just disre- disrespectful of herself and he's disrespecting her, right. my opinion, in a big way. So there's that extreme. But then there's the other extreme, which I think also is an extreme. Afghanistan recently is required all women to wear the full burqa. So they have yeah. to have everything covered, hands, eyes, everything, every single woman in this country of of Afghanistan. That is an extreme too. And I think my my dad encouraged me, which I think to this day is some of the best, like most sensible, common sense advice, go somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. Like go, don't go to either extreme. Don't be so modest that you're always covered up and people look at you and like, that's the modest girl. And then don't be immodest to the point where people are like, that's the immodest girl, or that's the girl that's just dressing that way. And this goes to for men too, to some expo- extent. I mean, men, I think typically are not using their body the same way women necessarily with fashion. Fashion for men is typically different than women, but there can be immodest men's fashion, I think too. Exactly. So it's not just for women, but I know what I'm saying right now is even going to be controversial. Of course, of course. And I mean, anything about this topic is controversial. And people think that, you know, to the one extreme, the women who are, you said more modest, but I think maybe a better word would be like more covered, like, you know, um, that's a good, that's a good distinction actually. Right. It's a really important distinction. So because you're not necessarily more modest if you're in a burqa. You're just more covered. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of these women will say, you know, I'm, you're immodest because you're not wearing a floor length. Um, you don't, you don't look like you walked off the set of little house on the prairie, Right. For the um, record, I am wearing kind of a prairie dress today, which I don't usually do, but this is a Carly Jean Los Angeles dress, which I love. We love the brand on the show and it's very comfortable, but you don't have to always wear a dress like this. Your but, dress is very cute, Jessica. Thank you. It's, I love the dress, by the way. Thank you, Carly Jean. But it's, you know, there's different, uh, the little house on the prairie style is in I mean, style right now. It is. It is. As but far I as mean, this kind like, of thing, but you're some people are very high, very high, you know, don't even show their wrists. Um, you know, their ankles are covered and they think that they are more modest, but they're just more covered. And um, a lot of uh, a lot of my friends dress this way. And, you know, they'll say, oh, you're wearing pants today. You know, I, I and I'm like, yes, I am. <laughs> I, I wear pants, uh, which, again, is a, is a contra- controversial issue, particularly, I think, in the Catholic circles um, and some and some evangelical circles. and some evangelical circles. You're right. And uh, they think that to be to be modest, you have to dress like that. Uh, but you can have style. Yeah, you know, you can wear color. You can um, express yourself. Like Rachel Zoe used to say, "Style is a way to say who you are without having to speak." Mm-hmm. And she's a Hollywood fashion stylist. Um, and and I always found that I I find that you know to be true. You can express your style like. And, and going back to what she said, I actually was visiting my mom at UCLA at the hospital. She was hospitalized there before she died. And I had an audition for Grey's Anatomy and I didn't have scrubs, you know, in my trunk of, of clothes. So I ran down to the bookstore and they sell scrubs in the UCLA bookstore and I put them on and then I ran up to see my mom really quick and I'm running out and I'm waiting for the elevator and I get into the elevator and this person came out of the room and they were like, excuse me, nurse, nurse nurse because I was dressed in scrubs I looked like a nurse they're like we need help in here and I said I'm I'm not a nurse I'm just dressed like one and the doors <laughs> shut 
<laughs> but most they, traumatic hospital experience ever. Like I'm dying, nurse. They're like, yeah. it's just an outfit. It's just a costume. <laughs> but you know, I was dressed like a nurse. And so they thought I was a nurse and they thought I could help them. And unfortunately I couldn't, but um, your, your clothing says so much about you. It really does. And so we should be more mindful about it, I think. I was just interviewing with Ginger Boilo, formerly Duggar. Mm -hmm. So she was sharing about her journey from kind of fundamentalism and they had very strict modesty standards that she grew up with and loosening up. Not that she's all wearing whatever, but I mean, she's very tastefully dressed, but that was a, an extreme that she experienced growing up. And I think there's a tendency when the sexual revolution happened and then there's such chaos in the culture. I mean, OnlyFans is huge oh, yeah. today. And so many women, I mean, like you said, in the high schools and junior high, the, the styles and the fashions for these young girls are getting kind of crazy, some of them. And so I think there's a tendency from some good people to say, well, we got to react against that. Yeah. We, we have, have to, to like solve that problem. To the other side. Right. But I think what I love about your clip here is here you are wearing like a cute dress, you know, you look, you look great and you're just saying, yeah, I'm not going to do bikinis and here's an alternative. Right. Which, I mean, I got nailed to the cross for that dress for my shoulders oh, and your my shoulders knees were showing. and yeah. my little kitten heel on my shoe. How can this girl be talking about modesty? <laughs> I think so much of virtue is in the mean. It's, I mean, St. Aquinas talks about this a lot. St. Yes. Thomas Aquinas, like, what is virtue? Right. A lot of it is in the happy middle where you're, you know, if you're going to be so restrictive of food and you're never going to eat and you're going to starve yourself, that's a problem. You're going to be, you're going to be a glutton and eat too much food and yeah. uh, indulge yourself. That's a problem. So what is the mean? Okay. Eat well, take care of your body, right. enjoy food once in a while for special occasions. If it's like a, you know, a special treat, but don't overindulge and don't right. under right. indulge, don't under eat. I've, I mean, I've had people go on this, you know, we try to eat as healthy as possible, um, but they get so crazy about it that if they go to a restaurant or something and there isn't something they can eat, they'll literally just sit there and starve because they feel like they just can't, there's nothing that they can, they can eat. You know, God gave us immune systems mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, you know, once in a while it's, it's not going to, hopefully not going to kill you. <laughs> What advice do you give to folks listening who maybe are on their own journey of discovering their personal style? So they want to be modest in both their heart and their clothing. They don't want to be in, in, at an extreme, but they're also trying to figure out what their style is. Um, I mean, it's, it's so hard. You know, back in the day, we would look at magazines, <laughs> but there was nothing I would say maybe really modest about magazines. The, the reason that I started that my swimsuits are um, the way they are, I guess, to sign the way are, because I looked up to the movie stars of the 1950s, so Audrey Hepburn, Grace Kelly. It's really hard to find uh, style icons today to look up to, but they're there. Where are they? I mean, who are your style icons today? Oh, gosh. Um, I really Kate like Middleton. Princess Kate. <laughs> I yeah. I the really, one, the one. I really do like she's Princess Kate. She's so proper Kate. though. I, I do like Kate. Yeah. I mean, I think she's very classy. She's very, uh, it's a very, uh, I think it's a very elevated style. It is. Um, and you know, it's like the style of maybe Audrey Hepburn and Grace Kelly, which I tend to, um, like a lot more than, than the style of, of today. <laughs> And, you know, there's this word going around all over. I'm not on TikTok, but TikTok and Instagram, demure. Demure is the word of the of the season, I guess. And so I saw this video and I'm like, why does everyone keep posting that they're demure and, you know, cutesy? And I looked up the definition of demure and it's modest in dress and behavior. And so I love that that's the trending word of the season. And I hope that people actually, you know, um, look at that and and go to the actual definition instead of just posting crazy videos with this sound clip. <laughs> what about modesty standards for men? Mo oh gosh, modesty standard. I mean, that's modesty standards for men is one of the um, things that people will start yelling about when you start talking about modesty. Why don't, why doesn't ever, anyone ever tell men that they have to dress modestly? And I'm like, maybe someone should, but I, I don't feel that's my calling. <laughs> That's fair. We will find a guest for the Lila Rose show that will be to talk about that. 
Yeah, I mean, I just look to the style icons of the past because sadly enough, besides Kate Middleton, there's nobody today that I really look up to for their clothing choices. I mean, Sounds look, like a, an obvious need in the market for someone to fill. Yeah, looking at, you know, the red carpet events, I'm like, they're not even, a lot of them are just wearing lingerie and I don't understand it. <laughs> Any final words of advice for women, especially who are on their own style and modesty journey? Um, pretty much how I ended my my talk. You know, we're all. Should we watch it? No, <laughs> no. Let's do it. Let's do it. Instead of being discouraged, I took matters into my own hands and I designed my own swimsuit. My goal is to disprove the age old notion that when it comes to swimsuits, less is more, and that you can dress modestly without sacrificing fashion. My inspiration for my swimsuit line is Audrey Hepburn, who is timeless and classy and who happened to have dressed very modestly. I don't think people think of Audrey Hepburn and think frumpy dumpy and out of fashion. These are some of my designs. I'm so gross. I hate listening to myself. And my tagline is, who says it has to be itsy bitsy? Well, to answer the question, if you look at today's society, everyone. Everyone says it has to be itsy bitsy. Fashion designers, the media, and let's face it, sometimes parents. Little girls would not be running around in sexy underwear and skimpy bikinis if it wasn't for their parents buying them for them. I believe that the woman was afraid to come out of the water because she had a natural sense of modesty about her that has been stripped away by today's culture. And we need to bring it back. I have dedicated a lot of my time. I travel all over the country speaking to girls about this issue. I've just written a book called Decent Exposure about it. And we need to teach girls that modesty isn't about covering up our bodies because they're bad. Modesty isn't about hiding ourselves. It's about revealing our dignity. We were made beautiful in his image and likeness. So the question I'd like to leave you with is, how will you use your beauty? Thank you. So good. So what's next for you, Jessica? I have started a few other businesses that are totally unrelated to um, the swimwear business, which I will continue to do. Uh, we're actually having a huge sale right now um, mm. because I'm moving my business out of California. And How long does the sale go on for? Um, probably for another month. Okay, this Another should month. come out before then, so yeah. check it out, guys. Yeah, it's buy one, get one free, which we've never done before, but we're really trying to clear the warehouse. Um, and one of my other businesses is uh, uh, an entrepreneur course, digital art entrepreneurship course for kids, because I think it's so important for kids to learn how business works. Um, my customer service team is always sending me screenshots of messages that people send, and I'm like, I don't think they understand how business works. Like, with the buy one, get one free, someone said, oh, I bought something two years ago. Can I just go pick something now for free? And I'm like, oh my gosh, they do not understand business at all. Um, but I, you know, I'm traveling the world with my husband and my three little kids and I homeschool them. So most of my time is spent mm -hmm. with them. Um, I just, I love to be around them. And so that's why I homeschool and I get sad when they're not with me. And I only have maybe a handful of years left with my son because he's 13 and I can't even, I can't even believe it. How do you balance business and homeschooling? Um, lots of coffee and a very supportive, saintly husband who is the best person I've ever met in my entire life. That's beautiful and encouraging, I think, to women to know that you can be a businesswoman and homeschool yes. <laughs> and be with your kids. Jessica, you're awesome. Thank you so much for joining the podcast. Thank you for having me. A huge thank you to our partner, EWTN. EWTN is the world's leading Catholic network, reaching millions with the truth about the faith, entertainment, and news. Check them out at EWTN.com.